Now, let's begin. We are sort of talking about this exhibition that Gallery Camille is hosting, and it is a photography exhibition, but what the title of it is, is Come Together, and the subtitle is Music is Revolution, uh, which, which is a great question that I'd love to start off with you is about, is about, can you talk about that? Music has always been an important part of your life. You've been firsthand witness to the, to the power of it, and it's inspired your writing. So of course, Gallery Camille would invite you into that. Tell me about what that, what that means to you when you hear music is revolution. Well, music has been uh, a catalyst for so much social change. And oftentimes it is music itself that embodifies that change. Uh, so music both pushes change and is the change. Mm -hmm. So uh, I've witnessed many iterations of changes in music in my lifetime. And I have seen where music has been um, a force for social change and for the uniting of people. Mm -hmm. Because music uh, has a, a spiritual connection with people often. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Probably an obvious question. You uh, write poetry, you write essays, you write short stories. For you, does it always come back to music as the primary influence, inspiration of your whole life? Yes. Yes, that's a very good observation. Uh, I, I began uh, writing as a kid. Uh, I was always a voracious reader and, uh, and library lover. All right. And uh, uh, my, my home away from home was McGregor Library in Highland Park. And I loved, mu I loved uh, uh, reading and writing. And uh, my father, at the same time, had a record store in uh, Detroit, uh, about maybe three or four miles away, uh, called Joe's Record Shop on Old Hastings Street. And then after the destruction of Hastings Street for the Chrysler Freeway, he moved to uh, 12th Street, mm -hmm. uh, a couple more miles uh, west, a few miles west. And so music permeated my life and the life of our family. And my uh, younger brother, Daryl, and I, we would uh, spend a lot of time at our dad's record store. Mm -hmm. And we were there during the, the transition and, uh, of uh, blues music. Uh, and, and African American taste. Uh, we were there to see that transition take place in, in Detroit in particular. It took the form of, uh, uh, the love of the new Motown. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, from that basis and spending so much time, uh, which would be unusual for a kid, uh, to be around so much music. I mean, I spent my time as a kid uh, when I wasn't in school quite often at the record shop and I would be, you know, reading billboard magazines, you know, I was like seven or eight years old and, uh, you know, uh, splicing tape, you know, that was one of our chores uh, to learn how to splice tape, reel to reel, uh, uh, reel to reel tape uh, on a metal bar <laughs> and uh, scotch brand tape. I mean, I can see it, you know, that, that, that plaid scotch scotch tape box the box that it came in the family and uh yeah yeah and uh so we had a lot of memories of being in music and i was always a writer and i wrote a lot in school i i won a contest for writing when i was a small kid and i never forget my dad allowed me to read a portion of my poem that i had written on his radio show he was a record producer and he had a radio show. He produced the Reverend C.L. Franklin, who was the father of Aretha. Mm -hmm. And uh, he produced all of Aretha's first gospel record. And so he had a very popular radio show, as did Reverend Franklin. And between the two of them, they kind of commandeered the uh, radio waves with many African-Americans 
uh, on Sunday night. That was a sort of ritual that many people tuned in to listen to Reverend C.L. Franklin. And so my daddy, one time he let me read my little poem uh, that I had won a contest. And the name of my poem was, I Love Michigan. Oh. And uh, I, I don't remember anything else it said though. <laughs> and, uh, but that was an exciting moment. And, uh, but uh, uh, I began writing and, and then I, uh, in the 60s, after my father's record store was destroyed, uh, in uh, the tumult of 1967, it, the, the aftermath, mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't destroyed by the people. It was really destroyed by authority. Mm. And um, um, I, uh, I uh, began writing. I, I became very active in the social movement. We, it's very hard to describe the extreme social upheaval that existed during that time. And, uh, and I became involved in the movement, as we called it. And I began writing, uh, things of that nature, protests, uh, protesting against discrimination mm -hmm. and, uh, particularly in the schools in which we went, uh, to which we went. I went to Highland Park School, mm -hmm. which at the time were still amongst the top public schools in the country. And I had the benefit of an extraordinary public education. And however, uh, there was a great deal of racial animus in the school. Many teachers did not want black students there and were mean to us. And there were uh, a number of sort of systemic kind of issues there. And so I began to uh, remonstrate against those things and, uh, and join the Black Student United Front and later the League of Revolutionary Black Workers, when I was a young person, I was one of the youngest people affiliated with that organization. And I, and I was still writing, but I had this music underneath me. As I got older and began to work, I, uh, I, I put the writing to the side for a while. And then in my, uh, 30s and 40s, began to pick it back up again. Mm -hmm. And the first writings I began to do during that time was um, uh, writing about music. Mm -hmm. uh, I was friends with uh, a New York um, music critic, a renowned uh, international music critic by the name of Dave Marsh. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and in association with him, and a number of other uh, very thoughtful music critics and music writers, uh, it really uh, kicked my writing about music up to another level. And we had a group at that time, uh, we, we communicated via, via uh, uh, various emails and uh, uh, lists, as we called them back in the day. And, uh, and I was writing about music. Uh, and I began to write about Detroit music. Um, and that is how I began to write about my father's record store, which had sort of been dormant in my consciousness all those years uh, after the destruction of his shop. And um, I wanted to bring his, his really genius back to the public domain. Uh, he, he had been uh, uh, quite legendary in his time. My father was Joe Von Battle. Mm -hmm. And he, however, uh, uh, and he opened up a record store in 1945 on Hastings Street. And he is one of the, the very first post-war record producers uh, in the country. And he began to produce, as I said, the, in later years, C.L. Franklin and Aretha. But he also produced John Lee Hooker. And uh, uh, a, a one-man band called Washboard Willie. Uh, he, he made a number of iconic blues records that were sort of seminal. Uh, and many of them represented the last of the kind of transition from the South to the North as, as the music began to morph into rhythm and blues. And so... Um, so I began to write about my dad, uh, particularly when the internet became available. Mm -hmm. And here he was, I 
obscurely known in Detroit uh, because he really, after 67, he uh, basically drank himself to death. Uh, he, he, he had great despair. He suffered from alcoholism for many years. And he um, just sort of died in obscurity, relative obscurity. And I began on the internet, when I just began to tell stories about being in the record store, I ran into these people all over the world who knew about my father. And it would be record collectors in Japan, in Australia, and in England. And they would know about my father's name and his record labels. And this was just shocking to me. And I, so I began to tell more stories in these various uh, message boards. And um, I became affiliated with a uh, connoisseur's wristwatch site called thepurist.com. Mm -hmm. And uh, they offered me an opportunity to be a moderator there. I love watches. And uh, they, they offered me an opportunity to be a moderator on, on this luxury site and, uh, and to particularly moderate a, a literary forum. And that is when I really uh, took off as far as a lot of my writing. And, uh, and, I, and it was during that period of time that I uh, began to uh, pull together a blog because by that time, blogs became available, blogging became a thing. And, uh, and I wrote this story about my father that now has been read all over the world. And uh, so music has been an essential part of my writing, uh, writing about music. And it's really how I uh, kind of uh, uh, morphed into the nom de plume of Martian music mm -hmm. uh, because uh, uh, I write very frequently about music. But I also write about music and social change. Uh, the role of music in, in uh, a lot of my development, Detroit's development. So thank you for asking. Yeah. Uh, I was going to say there, whether or not there was a point in your life where you realized that what you were also actually achieving was that you were becoming an historian too, rather than just, just a poet or an essayist. You were, you were capturing history too, and you've become such an important cultural historian. And you've been able to do that while writing about music because music and our history is intertwined. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. And, um, and then I began to realize uh, in the last decade mm -hmm. that I very expressly was writing in order to capture particularly this period of mid-century Detroit and mid-century African-American Detroit, because I could see that there was a, a deep tendency in the culture to erase, not, not just our existence, but to erase uh, our contributions, to erase this profound role that we played in Detroit itself. You can look at pictures some of the historical pictures uh, of Detroit, uh, of Detroit's factories, of Detroit's uh, industrial, you know, uh, development and all that, and often see not a trace of a black person. And, and whereas our presence was foundational, we, we could not have been coming up from the South by the millions and, and, and thousands uh, and, and then appear nowhere uh, in, in, in visual imagery. So, um, I, I began to uh, really uh, pull against that tendency to make us invisible. Mm -hmm. And that is another way that I began to engage, uh, not just musically, but with the history of Detroit, to, to accept the mantle that those of us, Afri those of us African Americans, we African Americans, who were here in Detroit who did not leave the city um, and who uh, uh, witnessed this, this, uh, this, these changes in the city, we have a tremendous responsibility, I believe, to accept the mantle of uh, storytellers of that period of time and claim our expertise. 
Mm-hmm. You know, many people, you know, they, they're looking at Detroit through Google Maps and they and they act like they're experts. Like, yes. really? Yes. <laughs> They'll tell you about a neighborhood that you grew up in. <laughs> and, and, and 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 as if you don't know what you're talking about. Right. So 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 you know, so there's issues like that, you know, and, and, and so I like to think the story and and and, and telling the truth about how we grew up, where we grew up, you know, uh, what it was like in growing up in this Detroit, good and bad. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think they're very important. And th- then there is these, this anthology that came out last year, The Detroitist. Ah! Uh, you have uh, Thank you. Great, great poetry and essays in here. And uh, sort of going off of what you just said, you know, being witness to the 60s and early 70s, everything that happened then. But then you've also, you're here in Detroit and you're being witness to 2010 and gentrification and, you know, the uh, the newcomers coming in and you address them in this book. And I think it's really great that you, you're, you, the tone you take with them is you're sort of saying, all right, well, you, all right, newcomers, but you should, you should know. It's sort of, um you want to educate them. Do you know what I'm saying? You want to mm-hmm. make sure that they are a appreciative of the gravity of the culture of all of it you know what i mean and mm-hmm. i love that about this book i i think i i'm thankful that you uh that you see that i'm gratified that you are able to articulate that mm-hmm. uh because i do regard myself as teaching yes mm-hmm. it comes through uh and then i guess one more question before i let you go is that can you tell me about just some of the things you find most fulfilling about writing poetry, performing poetry, because all of this history that you've lived through and all the history you continue to document, I have to imagine that it, that it sort of spurs a range of emotions. Could be, it, could be, uh, it could be anger sometimes. It could be uh, appreciation. It could be a lot of things. And I feel like maybe the writing of the poetry and, and the performing of the poetry is kind of cathartic, that it kind of lets you channel all those emotions and maybe find a peace of mind, maybe? Um, I think that um, I didn't, I have not, uh, I did not start out as a poet, although I've always been a rhymer. Mm -hmm. And I realize now that that was the beginning of it. I, even as a teenager, uh, I would uh, rhyme. I I would sit in the drum offices uh, back in the day and make rhymes. Uh, about whatever struggle was going on at that time, uh, much to the hilarity of the, the the older brothers and sisters that were around there, and uh, and I would make family rhymes, you know, for birthdays and things like that. So there's something about the uh, the developing a syntax all the time. For me, it generally just ends up somehow, even when I don't want it to, it ends up in rhyme. Mm-hmm. And uh, and I admire so many of the young hip hop artists mm-hmm. uh and rappers mm-hmm. and work and wordsmiths and um and and um um spoken word artists uh mm-hmm. for this ability mm-hmm. uh to uh to wrangle uh rhyme out of uh out of uh words right. and meter and stanza. So um I find it very satisfying because it makes a difficult project that is writing about a certain historical period even harder mm-hmm. because not only do you have to write it you have to try to make it rhyme too mm-hmm. and and i just that's just an added chaos added mayhem in there that it sort of appeals you know uh to uh, to me you know uh and makes it even harder it more more might make my brow sweat more uh, I, I had this most recent project, which is what I'm going to uh, do for the Come Together project. I'm going to uh, read some of the poetry that I wrote um, for the opera. This was one of the honors of my life to be able to uh, do my poetry for uh, for the Michigan Opera Theater's production of Twilight of the Gods, in which uh, the new director. Uh, artistic director, uh, Yaval Sharon, uh, asked me if I would 
play the role of the earth mother goddess named Erda. And, uh, and he wanted to uh, have her as the narrator of the entire opera. And I had to create this narration based on his translation of the German. And so this was quite a wonderful project. And uh, Mr. Wayne Brown, who is the CEO of the uh, Michigan Opera Theater, was very supportive. And uh, he and Yuval uh, just uh, let me have at it. And so I was uh, uh, really intrigued with it. I was flummoxed at first about how to take an opera about uh, the, 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 the stolen magic ring and uh and all of the gods and goddesses and mortals that are fighting over it and how to take that and not only write the story but to write it in rhyme and to have it in a syntax similar to the way i speak normally in my detroit ease without crossing a line and becoming sort of sitcom jivey so it was a very delicate balance, but I think that I caught it, and I think I was able to translate this story of these dysfunctional god and goddess families uh, in such a way that even some of some singers that have sung this opera uh, said that they were uh, uh, they found it elucidating. You know, it kind of uh, gave them an idea even further about what the opera was even about. So uh, th that's just one of the projects of which I am most proud. That is epic. That all sounds so epic. Well, that sounds like quite, quite an achievement to pull all that off. Like very, I, very graceful I balance, you. graceful balance there to do that. Um, yes, yes. It was, it was, it was so hard, and it was so much fun. Yeah, but fun too, you know. Um, and that comes through. I know that you know. Poetry is not easy, but it, it, it comes through sometimes that you are finding the poetry satisfying. I sense that just in the writing. When I, when I read your poem, which is in this newer book, Just Say Hi, uh, mm -hmm. it feels so rhythmic. It almost feels like you could put music to that as an accompaniment. You can almost have a little drummer in the background because it just feels like a song. So I think that's a great poem. So. That is oh, I'm so that. glad. Not a question. I'm so glad to hear you say that. I, I have long wanted, ever since I wrote that, yeah. or any of my pieces, I've always wondered, you know, what it would be like if they were put to song. Yeah. You know, put to some song or rhythm. Yes. Uh-huh. Yeah. That would be great. Yes. Marsha Music, thank you so much for joining me on this podcast. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Jeff. This has been absolutely wonderful. So nice to talk with you. We will have links in the show notes about the exhibition and links to... Marsha's blog. Thanks again, Marsha. Thank you. Bye-bye.